chapter 4, or find a Bible near you. Maybe there's one under the seat in front of you. I know we need to get more of them. We used to have a lot of them, but they walk out. So I guess if anything's okay to be walk out of the place, it's a Bible. Amen? If you need one, we'll give you one. But uh, Hosea chapter 4, I want to read one portion of Scripture tonight from the Old Testament and two portions of Scripture tonight from the New Testament about children. Traditionally, I bring a message around this time of the year just to kind of uh, get us really thinking about children because there's so many things coming up for them. And um, I, I want to speak on uh, a statement we're going to read in Hosea here about the forgotten children. The forgotten children. And I think we see history repeating itself. Israel already has gone down this path before us, but America seems to be following that path. And we certainly thank the girls for the timely song tonight that I think fit into this message quite well. Appreciate that. Brother Harry Riskina did go home to be with the Lord, a longtime missionary in India. Pray for his wife, Cindy Ann, as she wants to continue the work uh, that they have started in India and uh, for their two daughters and their spouses and grandchildren, too. It's been a hard time uh, for uh, them. Hosea chapter number four. Uh, I want to read this a little bit slowly. I just like, like it to really uh, settle in as we read it word by word, verses one through 11. And uh, just uh, I, I want you to Read it slowly so you'll think about America kind of in these terms, I fear. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing, and stealing, and committing adultery, they break out, and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish, with the beasts of the field, and the fowls of heaven, yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. <coughs> Yet let no man strive, nor reprove another, for thy, thy people are as they that strive with the priest. Therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people, and they set their heart on their iniquity. And there shall be like people, like priests, and I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their doings. For they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase, because they have left off to heed to the Lord, to take heed to the Lord. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. Hosea is a prophet on the precipice of Israel's demise. He is just before Israel will be horrifically treated by the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Roman Empire, and then through the severity of the Roman Empire, they will be dispersed all over the world for almost 2,000 years. What horrific, horrific price they're going to pay for forgetting God. And Hosea is a prophet 
who comes to them with this message just before it all starts. It is just horrific what Israel has suffered. And uh, to make things worse later in their history, they will say at the crucifixion of Christ, the Lord, his blood be on us and on our children. And boy, the things that, that Israel has faced, it's, it's only a miracle of God that they exist today. If you're wondering if God exists, you can answer that in one, in one word, Israel. Explain that. How can you outlast all those empires? But Hosea is just before the Assyrian Empire comes in and takes them alive and literally skins some of them while they're alive in front of the others. Assyria would be so hated that when some Jews would intermingle with them, and become what we know through marriage as the Samaritans, even in Christ's day, almost 800 years after Hosea, the Jews still would not even talk to a Samaritan because of the way they were treated. It was horrific. And it's all because they forgot the God who had been so good to them. And as I read this text, I can't help but think, of a parallel, it almost seems like America is going down that path. Israel went down so long ago. And it's just now, it's just now that God is finally starting to regather Israel back into their land since 1948. We see an amazing miracle taking place in front of us, the, the Valley of Dry Bones. Uh, the vision of Ezekiel 37 happening right in front of your eyes, your generation since 1948 to the point now in 2019 7 million Jews are back in their land there's only 14 million on earth over half of them are back in their land and six different prophets in the Old Testament said that God would scatter them among all the nations but then in the last times in the latter years he would regather them back into their land that's happening right in front of our eyes and day by day by day, Jews from all nations of the world are leaving those countries and going back to Israel. It's amazing, the regathering. God is setting up something. He's setting up what the Bible calls the tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble. That is when God is going to save Israel. And all Israel shall be saved and shall look upon him that shall pierce and they shall mourn for him that they had crucified and trust in him. And during those days, the Jews, the, the single men of the Jews, 144,000 of them are going to bring about probably the greatest revival the earth has ever seen. And what's neat is that today, Jewish mothers are giving birth to 100,000 Jewish little boys every year. God's setting this whole thing out right in front of our eyes. It's pretty neat to watch. Keep your eyes on Israel. And if you're going to get busy, you might as well get busy now. Because before that tribulation, God takes us out of here in the rapture, and we forever go to be with the Lord. And so if you're going to work, you might want to start now. Uh, because they're piling up in Israel, and the Lord is setting up something to, to happen really soon. But what a price that nation has paid for the last 2,500 years. And Hosea hits the nail on the head. This is why. He says in verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee. Thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. What a, what a consequence. God's not the one who's wrong here. Israel's the one who's wrong. You have forgotten me. You have forgotten my word. I am the one that started you through Abraham and built you up and loved you. You have been the apple of my eye. I've married you. You're not reckoned among the nations. I consider you my wife. God blessed Israel more than any nation of its time ever, and then they, they acted like God had never done a single thing for him. 
And they walked away and began to turn especially to other idols and other gods of the other nations and serve them. And they rejected the Lord and they rejected his word. But the thing about this tonight is the consequence, I will also forget thy children. Man, when Jesus was going up, probably the Via Della Rosa on his way to Calvary, and all the women were there weeping. Remember that? And he stopped the procession. And he said to those women, what? He said, don't weep for me. He says, weep for your children. Because he knew in 40 years after his ascension, Titus would come, despoil the temple, burn it to the ground, remove it stone by stone, so not one stone would be left upon another. And the children of Israel would be scattered to all the nations. Even to this day, Jews live in over 100 different nations on earth. Just like the Bible said. That's called the diaspora to the Jews, or we call it the dispersion uh, in, in the English. And boy, God dispersed them. God did exactly what he said to them. And now he's doing the, exactly what he said would happen afterwards. He's gathering them back together. What a price the children paid. Because a nation forgot God. And sometimes I can't help but equate this with America. Uh, God has been good to America. We are what we are because of God. Nothing else. It's not like we have some superior intelligence. We don't. There's other nations more educated than us. There's other nations smarter than us. Uh, but God has blessed us. He said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. And we have loved Jerusalem. He said, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. And he, we have blessed Israel. And because of that, God has blessed America. But America seems to be following this very path in forgetting God. And it seems like we live in the day of the forgotten children. The government has forgotten the children in that sense. They said about the religious instructions in the pu uh, public schools over in Papua New Guinea, mandatory. We don't have that here in this America anymore. We used to. I used to go to religious instructions when I was growing up. We had the Protestants and the Catholics, and you went to religious instructions while you are going to the public school. We don't have that anymore. In 1962, the Supreme Court decided our children could not pray in school or be led in prayer by teachers. The next year, in 1963, they decided that public reading of the Bible would not be allowed nor by teachers. In 1980, they took the Ten Commandments out of the public schools. Later on, they even took a moment of silence out of the public schools. I don't remember the year, because the Supreme Court decided that if they led children in a public or, or in a moment of silence, those children might think about God. That was their reasoning. We can't have a moment of silence because some child might think about God during that time. What a crime that would be for a kid to think about God. So God is out and humanism is in, socialism is in, environmentalism is in, Marxism is in, evolution is in, globalism is in, atheism is in, agnosticism is in, and every type of deviance known to mankind is in. And this is where 89% of the children of our country are educated in the public schools. Then from there they go off to college and universities. And by the time they're in the college or in the university, 75% of the children of faith abandon their faith, abandon the Bible, abandon church by the time they are indoctrinated uh, in the name of education. Now, it's easy to point at the government and the Supreme Court, but another institution on earth is the family, and the Bible is out of the family. We've taken the Bible out of the family as much as we've taken out of the schools. So we can't blame the schools and the Supreme Court or the government, but, but the, the, the Bible is out when it comes to a lot of families, maybe not yours. The faithful usually show up on Sunday nights, but <clears throat> there's no Bible reading in, in homes. Prayers aren't said. There's no devotions, and in a lot of homes, the families don't even eat together anymore. 
I can remember growing up in a little Protestant home, United Church of Christ, which is one of the most far out liberal denominations in the whole country. That's what we grew up in, the United Church of Christ, our family. But we said prayers at night. We weren't even saved. We had to memorize prayers and, and, and say them. Even before we, eat, we ate, we used to say, God is good, God is great, let us thank him for this food we eat. That's a little rhyme, but man, I learned two things from that. God is good and God is great. And we don't have that today. Sometimes even in Christian homes, prayers are not said at night before we go to bed. We let Hollywood put us to bed. Every night, Hollywood put us to bed. Television in, cell phones are in, Hollywood's in, sports. Can, can we invent any more sports? Is it, is it humanly possible to invent any more sports than we have in this nation? Years ago, England began calling Sunday Sports Day. In England's past, Sunday used to be the Lord's Day. But look what has happened to that nation. They're in dire straits over there in England. And we're following them in America. Sunday is becoming Sports Day. It's becoming Fun Day instead of the Lord's Day. And the Lord's Day has been desecrated in our country. By sports, there's more children participating in sports on Sunday by far than there are going to church. We got our kids involved in everything. Soccer, and softball, and baseball, and volleyball, and dancing, and ballet. Alcohol is flowing like water in the streets. Pretty soon we're going to be pot smokers, legally. Our schools, our, our homes, rather, are just saturated with secular news broadcasts, newspapers. And the family is on the carousel. I call that the metaphor for life of most families, the carousel. Get on, go around as much as you can, have as much fun as you possibly can before you get off. That's the metaphor for life nowadays. Darien Lake, Cedar Point, Epcot Center, Disneyland, whatever. Any kind of entertainment. And I wonder if all, of, in, in all of this, if the children have not been forgotten. I wonder sometimes if God has not stepped back and said, okay, you want to raise your children without me? Have at it. Let's see how well you do. Man, these are bad times. There's three institutions. I've, I've spoken about government so far tonight and the family, but there's also the church. The churches are closing up. The churches are compromising. The churches are ignoring the evangelization of the children in their area anymore. Uh, there's, there's many, many children uh, or churches that have folded up their Sunday schools, their ch children's churches. They don't have vacation Bible schools anymore. No transportation ministries that try to bring them in from the community to hear the word of the Lord. And uh, there is not the emphasis or the focus on children that there used to be. Many pastors are compromising and quitting and giving up and churches are closing everywhere. I just heard about the church in Akron closing up this week. It breaks my heart. Uh, a pastor called me from Huntsville, Alabama. And he's been only a pastor there for three years. And he's already sent two laymen out to start churches from that church. And then he called me up and said, Pastor Cole, I have been offered three church buildings that have closed up recently. I don't know what to do. We don't have anybody to get in there. And so now this is Alabama, Bible Belt. This is in New York, it's Alabama. So I told him, brother, seize those churches. Have a service at least once a month. So according to the IRS, you can keep it open and keep it as a church. And pray that God will send us some pastors. Pastors with a vision. Uh, pastors with love for their communities and, and for the children. I think children, I think churches have forgotten the children. 
And as a result, a lot of children today are lost. They're lost in their sins. A lot of youth are lost. A lot of teens are like sheep without a shepherd, just being herded like cattle into pleasure and partying in colleges and universities where any faith they may have is attacked viciously. I think I mentioned this morning, I'm not sure, about 8,000 teenagers a day are contracting a sexually transmitted disease, an STD, venereal disease of some sort, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, something. There's all kinds out there. 8,000 a day, brand new. Now, if you go to the CDC website, that's the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, that's about the first thing that comes up because it's such an epidemic. I can't fathom those numbers. 8,000 teens will get a disease today that have never had a disease before. Tomorrow, on Monday, another 8,000 will. On Tuesday, another 8,000 will. On Wednesday, another 8,000 will. On Thursday, 10 million a year, 20 million Americans a year when they count the ones 24 years of age and over, but over half of them are 15 to 24, and that's about 27,000 a day, but 8,000 of those are teenagers. 8,000. That's a lot of disease. Some of that's curable, some of it isn't. Suicide is the second leading cause now of death among children and teenagers. Children thinking about suicide, attempting suicide, committing suicide. Children in a country that has so much. The number two prescribed drug in America is antidepressants. The leading cause of suicide the leading instigator of suicide among children and, and teens is depression. Depression. Children aren't happy. They, we used to be so happy when we had nothing but maybe one football in the whole town. We remember, I remember the kid in our town who had the football. We'd go over to his house. And he was a really lousy football player. <laughs> but we had to include him in the plays or he'd take his ball and go home. I'm serious. He had a football. The boy had a football. And man, every day we'd get home, do our chores on the farm, and we'd, we'd go and play football until it was dark and mosquitoes were eating us and everything. We just couldn't stop. We had so much fun. We weren't depressed. But man, we live in a day and age when children have everything and anything, and it's caused depression. You know, that's all written in a book called Ecclesiastes. It says the more you get of the things of this world, the more you get of the knowledge of this world, the more you get of the wisdom of this world, the more depressed you'll be. Solomon used the word heaviness to describe it. That's what the word depression is in the Bible. Heaviness. What's the answer? Turn to Mark chapter 10. We had a dysfunctional home growing up, but we never thought about committing suicide. Man, we just wanted to live through it and get through it and go on with life. What's the answer for children? In Mark chapter 10 and verse 13, it says, And they brought young children to him. There's the answer. The source of joy is Jesus Christ. The source of happiness. The source of peace on the inside. If you're a child here tonight and you're depressed, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he said, I have come not only that you can have life, but that you may have it more abundantly. Abundant life is found in Jesus Christ. If you lost everything you own today and all you had left was Jesus Christ, you'd be, probably be happier than you've ever been because he is the source of joy and happiness and peace. 
said, Peace I leave, un leave you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You kids need Christ. Your children need the Lord. Your grandchildren need the Lord. Your neighborhood children need the Lord. It says this, and they brought young children to him. That's what you need. If you're here tonight without Jesus Christ, come to him as early as you can in life. The Lord Jesus loves you. You know, you might think there's more joy in having a cell phone than having a Bible, but you're wrong. Jeremiah one time said the, about the Bible, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. What a source of joy the Bible is. You put that cell phone, internet, and all those other things away, get your Bible out, and you'll be the happiest kid on your block. They'll all wonder what's wrong with you. They will. They'll wonder what's, what got into him, what got into her. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And boy, what a testimony you could be to the kids your age and this generation. Now, it's not your fault that you were born during this time and day when there's, there's so many distractions that just seemed intent on doing one thing, and that's keeping you away from God. It's it just, it just what it seems like. It seems like all this stuff is just flooding the world today, all this electronic technology, and it just keeps people in strong delusion and distraction. Boy, you got to fight that. I have to fight it. I don't even like this stuff. I don't know how to use a cell phone. Everybody feels sorry for me that. Don't feel sorry for me. I'm having a blast. I'm on an adventure with my Lord all the time, just seeing what he's going to do next. It's pretty neat. And all that stuff on the internet and television, I, 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 can't, I can't watch a news broadcast for five minutes, but I'm, I'm looking for a rock or a brick or something to throw through the television, you fools. I just, I just can't handle it. But I, I love just being in the presence of the Lord. Best time you could ever have is like four in the morning when the birds are singing outside and you got your Bible open. They're not worried about anything. The birds, they're having a time. Reminds me of some of the things Jesus said about the little birds that he takes care of and Mrs. Lindsay's going to sing about that for us next Sunday. Amen? His eye is on the sparrow. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm going to close this down. There's another text in Matthew 18, verses 1 through 14, study. But let's just read the end of this here, what happens. In, in Mark chapter 10, 13, And they brought young children to him that he should touch them. What a wonderful thing if you had. Imagine living back then and letting God touch your children. Well, did you know God can still touch children today? Amen. Make them brand new. Call them and use them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. Now, before we get too hard on the disciples, understand when this happened. This happens just before the crucifixion of Christ. For three years, there hasn't been any kids around except occasionally when he healed one or took his lunch or something. But there haven't been any kids around. And so the disciples were kind of like saying to the moms or dads or whoever brought them, get these kids out of here, would you? Because that's all they knew. That's all they had experienced was that Jesus was working with adult men. That's all they knew for three years. But the Lord's going to teach them something here. And so these moms and dads, maybe, maybe some grandmas and grandpas got their little bundles, their one uh account, Luke, I think, says infants, and the others say little children. They brought them to Jesus, and they said, boy, maybe he could just touch them, lay his hands on them, and bless them. And so the disciples exploded with this, you know, this is not what it's about. But notice our Lord's reaction here in verse 14, but when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. Doesn't say he was a little displeased. It says he was much displeased with his disciples. And he, he just constantly used every chance he could to teach these men uh, what the ministry was all about. And he said to them, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. Boy, there's a message for America right there. 
So many parents absolutely forbid their children to come to Jesus Christ, to come to church. It used to be they'd kick them out of the house and push them on our buses. I remember those days where they'd say, Get, if you didn't take my kids, I don't care when you bring them back. We're going to have a picnic after church this Sunday, so they might get home an hour or two late. That's great. I remember those days. I remember the season for 18 years in our church's history where we had between 100 and 130 bus kids in church every week for 18 consecutive years. They would just, they would just push me. Yeah, yeah, you want them? Yeah, take my cousins too. Take the nephews, get them out. Boy, it's a different world now. It's an anti-Christ world now. And uh, they're keeping the children away from the Lord. But he says, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Let me say to you kids that are here tonight, don't harden your hearts. Man, don't let that become your practice because there comes a time when a person hardens their hearts and God says, you know, I think I'll just go talk to someone else. Man, if God's talking to you, man, take advantage of that. No matter what your age is, if the Lord's speaking to your heart, do not harden your heart. Praise the Lord. He's spending any time with you at all. Amen. And he took them up in his arms, verse 16, put his hands upon them and blessed them. Now, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He wants little children brought to him, but boy, are we in a contest for their souls. Fifty years ago, Dr. Jack Hiles wrote a book called Satan's Bid for Your Child. Fifty years ago, and he laid out all that was coming in this country. Satan's Bid for Your Child. And man, it was almost prophetic what he said 50 years ago. Because boy, he, Satan is fighting for the soul of every child in our country. And we need to fight for them too. So as we go into this season, I just wanted to bring a little message to challenge you. Uh, we don't want to displease the Lord by saying, well, we don't want the kids around here. You know, they jump through the drywall and all these other things, and we got to fix it, and who cares? You know, drywall you can be fixed. I know how to fix drywall. I've learned how. Pastors have to. <clears throat> we put new drywall up, and Hilltop Baptist down by the kitchen. The week we put it up, some kid ran right through it. And some of you know who I'm talking about. So I got some new drywall out, and put it up, taped it, gooped it, sanded it, compounded it, and painted it. But let us not be displeased with the children. Now, we've got some things. we got kids going to camp tomorrow all week long. We need to be in prayer for them, pray for the workers. Last week, the first junior camp, there was 180 children there. Amen. We hope there will be a lot there this year, this week rather. We want to pray for them. I uh, want to fast for them. I don't care, our church or whoever church they go to, that they'll open their hearts, that they'll be saved. Children need to be saved, and God can call children. It's in the Bible how God calls children. We've got that. Next week, there's Daily Vacation Bible School over at the Hilltop Baptist Church <clears throat> with Jeremy Smith and his family from Alabama. They love the Lord. They love kids. Maybe you can bring your kids over to that, your grandkids, neighborhood children. If it's another church, who cares? <clears throat> who cares? Kids can't get too much. No kid gets too much of God these days or too much Bible. But try to get them there, leave them off, stay, whatever. We got uh, hometown heroes or, as our theme, and, and uh, we're going to have a Purple Heart recipient there. Monday, we're going to have the firemen Tuesday and the policemen Wednesday and the Thursday, the supervisor of the town of Evans is going to be there and then they're going to have all kinds of bounce houses and all that, but good preaching and teaching and, and song time and fun time, snacks, that's next week. 
We have our vacation Bible school here coming in August. And uh, we're going to try to hit that and promote that the week before with the Eden Corn Festival Parade that goes right down the street here. It's one of the biggest parades in all of western New York. And we have a float in it every year. And we'll have the musicians up playing music. We'll be throwing out candy to the kids and we'll be distributing flyers about Vacation Bible School the next week. David and Joy Corn are going to be with us from Houston, Texas. He's a tremendous evangelist. He loves the Lord. If you've ever seen him work with kids, he is good. You're going to have to trust me. But boy, does he love the Lord. He's a gospel illusionist, but he preaches and he really gets uh, those children under the sound of the gospel. He likes to fast. Before he comes to a church, he prays and fasts before he comes. That God will use him. And then we have family revival over at Hilltop about a, a month after Vacation Bible School with the Kevin Walker family. And then at Old Time Baptist, they got their camp meeting. They have something for kids every morning. Good stuff. And maybe we can rescue some kids. Every Wednesday night here, we have kids clubs. Sunday morning, we have Sunday school classes. During the school year, we are involved with Child Evangelism Fellowship, going into the public schools. Now, maybe tonight God is calling you to work with children. Um, we didn't look at Matthew's account, but in Matthew 18, Jesus said, Whoso re receiveth one of these little ones that believe in me, receiveth me. In an efficacious way, when you minister to children, you are ministering to Jesus Christ himself. And Mrs. Lindsay works with Child Evangelism Fellowship, Pastor Seth, Renee, Rebecca, I don't know who else goes in, Calvin's gone in, others. Don't mean to ignore anybody here. Who are you pointing at? Eva, all right. But there are other doors opening. And it's only an hour a week. And maybe some of you can go in. Maybe, maybe more doors will open up at Frontier Central School District, Eden Central School District. We're going into Lakeshore Central School District now, Buffalo Schools. Amen. We have this opportunity to go in with them. And uh, maybe you can find an hour. I know most of you are working everything. It's pretty hard. But, but uh, it's an hour a week, and you can be trained on how to have an effective ministry. And, you know, children will get saved. They will. They'll get saved. A lot of children will get saved and trust Christ as their Savior. All kinds of things coming up for children. Maybe God's calling some of you tonight just to surrender your life to that ministry. It's, it's, it's a hard ministry. Sometimes you don't see fruit till years later. Um, but God will bless you. And so think about the message tonight, Hosea. Uh, and, and his pronouncement of judgment, and boy, that all came to pass, and the children suffered so horribly in Israel when they forgot God. But maybe there could be a remnant of righteous people all over America who have little churches trying to reach some kids and reach out to them and save them, and maybe God will hold his hand back for a while and let us work that. Let's sing some songs. Uh, Brianna, if you'd come. If you have to leave, you can, but uh, turn to page 780. I'd like to sing some songs in closing.